Okay. Let's um, let's just take a moment to pray, and uh, then we will uh, get into our class today, our lecture today. Um, could one of us um, please uh, lead in prayer? Kiran, can you lead us in prayer this morning, please? Yes, sir. We'll pray. Father God, we come before you turn once again and we say thanking you, Father God, for all things. Father God, give your wisdom and knowledge, Father God, to the subject, Father God, that we can understand subject and your revelation, Father God, and move forward. Take care of every side. Thanking you, Father God. Almighty Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for uh, joining this class, this lecture today, Revelation Daniel. Uh, we are going through the book of Revelation, and uh, we are uh, um, reading through verse by verse and um, looking at... Um, of course, trying to understand what is written and this also understanding the sequence of things that are uh, going to happen. Uh, we went through, uh, of course, we started the Revelation chapter one and we've been progressing. Uh, last week, uh, we went through Revelation chapter seven, uh, where we had, uh, uh, we saw uh, the, so this is in the first part of uh, the tribulation. Like we mentioned last week, Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, till end of Revelation chapter 10, is the first half of the seven-year tribulation. And then Revelation chapter 11, verse 1, till end of Revelation 19, that is the second half of the tribulation. Um, the reason we can say that uh, is because in Revelation chapter 11, uh, uh, Revelation chapter 11, 12, and 13, the time is given for us. In both these three, in all of these three chapters, it clearly tells us uh, about uh, the three and a half years that are left uh, 1,260 days or um, 42 months or time, times and half a time. And so it, it is given to us in different ways as we will see when we get to chapter 11. Um, so we see clearly there is that 42 months or three and a half years from chapter 11 till end of chapter 19. That's why we can say chapter six verse one till end of chapter 10 is the first half of the tribulation. So what we are seeing in the first half of the tribulation, which we have already read, is it starts off with the seven seals. Then we read about the 144,000 Jewish, uh, we call them Jewish evangelists, uh, because they are specially marked by God as servants of God. They go to serve God um, during the tribulation. Then, in chapter eight, we we saw the um, seven uh, trumpets, the beginning of the seven trumpets, where um, uh, as each trumpet is being sounded, there are um, uh, uh, different judgments being poured out. So we we went through that, and then in chapter nine, we we looked at. Uh, the seven trumpets continues, but the uh, the uh, the uh, the the judgments, the, the the things that happen, are even more severe. We are actually seeing demonic powers that are released on the earth, uh, causing all kinds of things to happen. Right. So, chapter nine. Uh, we read through chapter nine, is that right? I think we went through till uh, 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 end of chapter nine. Yeah, yeah, I forget now. Last week. Y'all remember? I'm oh, sorry. 
Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, so we, uh, we uh, stopped at the end of chapter nine. So in chapter nine, we have the fifth and the sixth trumpets and, um, and uh, the, uh, the thing is, um, the we ended chapter nine, where we saw that even though all these judgments are being poured out on the earth, and there is so much of devastation happening, um, there are people who do not repent. Now, on the one hand, there are people who die for the word of the Lord and for the testimony of Jesus Christ, like we saw in Revelation chapter uh, 6 and uh, verse 9. Uh, we saw that there are people who are being martyred or being killed. Uh, but then uh, in Revelation 9, end of Revelation 9, which where we stopped last week, the um, there are people who refuse to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or who to refuse to repent. They continue on in their own wicked ways. Okay, so let's pick up today from uh, Revelation chapter 10, verse 1 onwards. Uh, any questions till this point? Uh, You're following with me like over the last couple of weeks uh, through Revelation. Any questions? Everyone's okay. All right. Revelation chapter 10, we're going to read from verse 1. Revelation chapter 10 is... Um, like uh, uh, we, we usually, it's referred to as a parenthetical chapter, meaning uh, in this chapter, John personally has an experience. Um, the angel of God comes to John and tells John, John, uh, eat this book. And this is typical, uh, uh, this kind of an experience is typical uh, of God imparting his word to people. Uh, to especially to prophesy. Uh, you would remem no, remember that even Ezekiel had a similar experience where uh, he was given a scroll to eat. Uh, so he ate the scroll and then he had to prophesy. So it's an, an experience, a spiritual experience uh, that is typical of saying God is giving this individual, this prophet, his word so that he can speak it out. He can release that word. So that's kind of what John experiences in chapter 10 here. And uh, let's read that, please. So we could um, uh, read all 11 verses. Um, Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. Um, could somebody read that for us? Maybe Aaron, you can read it if your mic is okay. All right, um, anyone else? Okay, Kevin. Uh, Revelation chapter 10, uh, verses 1 to 11. Okay, no problem, no problem. Kevin, you can read, please. I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like the pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars when he cried out seven thunders alter their voices now when the seven thunders alter their voices i saw a i was about to write but i heard a voice from heaven saying to me sealed up the things which the seven thunders alter and do not write them. The angels whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and sought by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it and the sea and the things that are in it that there should be delay no longer but in the days of the 
Surrounding of the seventh angel. Sounding of the seventh. Sounding of the seventh. Angel. Sounding of the seventh angels. When he is about to sound the mys mystery, mystery of God, of God. mystery of God would be finished, as he declared to his servant, servant, the prophets, when the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said. Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angels who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angels and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, You must prophesy, prophesy again about my peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Mm, thank you. So, um, chapter 10, like we said, is a parenthetical chapter, meaning it's like, uh, okay, here's something that's happening. It's not uh, part of the sequence of events that are being unfolded uh, or being revealed concerning the future, but it's a personal experience that John the Apostle is having. But even in that, there, there, there's some interesting observations there. So here's this big, mighty angel that John sees, and it's 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 really huge, right? That uh, meaning John is having this vision, and he's he's, he's seeing this angel uh, so big. Uh, uh, it says one foot on the land, one foot on the sea, and his voice is like the voice of a Lion roaring. Um, so John is seeing this big, powerful angel. Now, um, whether the angel was literally of um, you know this this huge size, meaning uh, he's from the heaven to the earth, uh, or whether it's something that portrayed to him in a vision, you know, we don't exactly. Could there be angels that are so big and so so? Uh, huge, possibly, I don't know, but this is what John is seeing, and and then he hears um, what he calls as the sound of seven thunders, you know, um, as is verse four. Uh, so it seems like from verse four, it's when he hears this voice, the or the sound of seven thunders. There's something intelligible that John can hear. Um, but he's immediately instructed not to reveal what he's heard. In other words, keep it secret. Uh, don't reveal that. And so, uh, you know, um, the uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, just a minute. Let me note this down. Okay. So, John is uh, you know John uh, uh, hears the voice of seven thunders, and um, uh, and you know he's instructed don't write this down don't don't write uh, that means don't record what you've heard right so we don't know now the same angel who's standing uh, on, on the sea one foot on the sea one foot on the land with his hand raised to heaven. Uh, he's making an announcement, and this announcement is pretty interesting uh, in verse 7. And this angel is saying that in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, now remember, uh, we have gone through six trumpets, right? And there's one more trumpet left, the seventh angel, uh, who's going to sound the trumpet. But what this angel that John is saying in Revelation chapter 10 is announcing is that when the seventh angel is going to sound, the mystery of God would be finished. 
right? Now, the seventh angel is sounding in the next chapter. When we go to Revelation chapter 11, uh, we find that uh, this uh, seventh angel is uh, uh, blowing the trumpet. Now, this is a little challenging to interpret. What is What does this angel mean? What does this angel, this Revelation chapter 10 angel mean when this angel is saying in verse 7 that when the seventh angel sounds the trumpet, the mystery of God would be finished. That means all the things that God has mm, spoken through his servants, the prophets, uh, is going to be completed, is going to be uh, all, you know, will, will all be fulfilled. Um, how do we understand that? Now, there are two possibilities, uh, and you would find if you read uh, in the way people interpret um, this, that you know there are differences of um, positions on it or understanding and explanations on this. So because of Revelation 10 verse 7 saying that this seventh angel when the seventh angel sounds, everything will be fulfilled. Uh, some people put that so sound of the seventh angel at the very end. That is, our revelations, at the end of Revelation 19, that means they move all the other things that is written between chapters 11 to 19 in between before the sounding of the seventh angel. So that's some, some people rearrange things the sequence of things like that and move the seventh angel to the end of Revelation 19 uh, because of what we read in Revelation 10 verse 7. So that's some some people interpret it. But what we are going to do and what I, I, I do is I just read, read on in the sequence of events uh, because the seventh angel is sounding in Revelation chapter 11. I mean, the right next, the, the very next chapter, the seventh angel is making its announcement, or the seventh trumpet is announced. Um, there is this huge celebration of uh, declaration. So when the seventh angel sounds, which we will read in chapter 11, when the seventh angel sounds, there's a huge celebration in heaven, uh, declaring that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord in Christ. Now, uh, some people, like I said, move that to the end of Revelation 19. Well, I don't feel it's necessary to do that. I just feel it's perfectly fine. Leave it in chapter 11. Leave it in that same sequence. And understand that many times uh, uh, God declares things in advance. Right? So just because there's this celebration happening in chapter 11, saying, the kingdoms of our world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and Christ is perfectly fine because God announces things ahead of time. And so there's, that's not a problem at all. It's just a matter of, you know, we're just talking about three and a half years when, uh, when uh, uh, all of this will be fulfilled. So it's nothing compared to, you know, 2,000 years or 4,000 years uh, where certain things God has spoken well in advance and it took, you know, huge uh, length of time from an earthly sense for that to be fulfilled. So that's the position um, I personally take and I, I share with you that um, we don't have to move the seventh trumpet to the end of Revelation 19 just because of what we read in Revelation chapter 10 verse 7. What we understand is this big angel in Revelation 10 is saying that when the seventh angel sounds, things are getting really close to be, for all the prophecies to be fulfilled. It's 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 like the announcement that it's the end of time. And literally, uh, it's just, if you look at the timing, it's literally just three and a half years uh, from the sounding of the seventh angel from the time Revelation 19 ends. That's all the time is. Uh, are you all with me so far? Did you understand it uh, or did I confuse you? I was just giving you two different views on Revelation 10 verse 7 and uh, the position that uh, I personally 
am convinced about. Did I convince? Did I confuse you, or did you? Is that clear? Uh, if you want me to repeat, I can. All right. Okay. I I see your comments there. All right. Thank you. So this angel is saying, Revelation chapter ten. This angel, big angel, standing and saying, John, when the seventh trumpet sounds, it's the time for all the prophecies that the prophets have spoken to come to pass, right, to be fulfilled. And sure enough, like I said, three and a half years, everything is done. Of course, there is the thousand year millennium and all that that comes after it. But essentially, um, the Lord Jesus comes at the end of that three and a half year period and the kingdoms of our world become the kingdoms of our Lord in Christ, as the seventh angel announced. Then the next thing that we see in Revelation 10 is like, like I mentioned earlier, uh, John is encouraged to eat that little book. Uh, again, it's symbolic. It's uh, it's not like he actually chews on a book, uh, but it's uh, it's representing something. And in prophetic um, uh, 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 prophetic language, it simply means that God is giving His words to John to prophesy. And uh, John eats it. It's Initially, it's sweet, you're receiving God's word, but it's bitter in his stomach because the things he's going to prophesy really are not, you know, are, are things of judgment, are things that are going to bring great devastation uh, to people on earth. So that's why it becomes bitter. And then the angel says, John, you have to speak about it, prophesy again. And he had to prophesy about peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. That means you know, you're going you're gonna to announce what God wants to say about all of these. Okay, so that brings us to the end of chapter 10. Now, at the end of chapter 10, what has happened so far? The seven seals, judgments, have taken place. Six trumpets, judgments, have taken place. End of chapter 10. That is the middle of the tribulation. So as you read chapter 11, you will find it, it clearly tells us, okay, this is where you are. Okay. Chapter 11, as we get into chapter 11, um, we see God speaking to us about the two witnesses. So chapter 11, uh, we will read. I'm just giving a little overview. Chapter 11 begins by talking about the temple in Jerusalem or the city of Jerusalem and the temple. It's saying that the city is going to be trodden down by the Gentiles. Temple is going to be desecrated for 1,260 days. That is three and a half years or 42 months. And then it says there are going to be two witnesses. Now, it doesn't, Revelation 11 doesn't give us the names of the two witnesses. So, you know, like uh, we've said, we will have to look into other places in scripture to see if there's anything else the Bible says about who these two witnesses are or make up a best uh, guess uh, based on what we can see from other places in scripture. So, uh, we will read about these two witnesses. The other thing in Revelation 11 is it talks to us about what these two witnesses will do starting from the middle of the tribulation and it goes all the way till the end of the tribulation. That is the three and a half years. Okay. So what we will see in Revelation 11, chapter 12, and also in chapter 13 is the narrative starts in the middle of the tribulation and tells us of things that will continue through the rest of the tribulation for three and a half years. Okay, so that's I just want to say that that it starts talking about the two witnesses and says this is what the two witnesses will do for the three and a half years. This is what's going to happen. So starts in the middle, goes till the end. What the th two witnesses will do. Chapter twelve talks about what Satan will do the devil, the dragon, from the middle of the tribulation till the end. 
And interestingly, in chapter 12, it gives us also a reflection. That means it says this is what happened in the past. This is what will happen for the three and a half years. Chapter 13 is very much similar. It starts off in the middle of the tribulation and tells us what the, um, it's refers to as the beast and the second beast, that is the Antichrist and the false prophet, what they will do for three and a half years. That is the second part of the tribulation. So these three chapters are talking about a three and a half year period starting from the middle till the end. Chapter 11 speaks about the two witnesses. Chapter 12 speaks about what the dragon, that is Satan, does. Chapter 13 talks about what the Antichrist and the false prophet do during the three and a half year period. Is that okay? So it's like it's telling us about that entire duration of time. So let's read uh, chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through 6, please. Somebody could read that for us. Chapter 11, verse 1 through 6. Um, Dave can read it. Chapter 11, right? 1 through 6? Yes, please. I was given a rig like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshippers. But exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will temple on the holy city for 42 months and I will appoint my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstand and they stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouth and devours their enemy. This is how anyone who wants, wants to harm them must die. They have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Mm, okay. So, now... Um... What we see interesting is this. The uh, verse 1 begins by talking about the temple of God and the altar. Okay. So it's saying, so our focus now shifts to the temple of God on the altar. So we're talking about the temple in Jerusalem. Now, right now, the temple in Jerusalem does not exist. And we know the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, the temple that where Solomon's temple was there. Solomon's temple was destroyed first, first time around when Nebuchadnezzar came. Uh, the Babylonians came, they destroyed it. It was rebuilt. And uh, it was rebuilt, you know, by uh, Ezra, Haggai, Zechariah, during their, those times, the prophets and others. After they came back from Babylon, they rebuilt the temple. King Herod, when you come into Jesus' time, King Herod expanded the temple court, renovated it, made it bigger, made it look better, etc. But then shortly after that, after Christ's crucifixion, the temple was destroyed a second time. Um, this was by the Romans uh, around AD, AD 70. So even the temple that was rebuilt, the second temple was destroyed. Then subsequently, the Arabs or Muslims came in and they occupied that space and um, they built their mosque 
and uh, uh, the dome of the temple, and they have occupied um, uh, maybe not all of it, but a portion of it. Uh, they initially occupied all of it, but that was recovered by the Jews during um, the 1967 war, the, the west side of it. So anyway, today what we're having is we have the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, but it's really occupied by the Arabs. They are using it as their place of worship. They have their mosque and so on over there. One part of it, the Jews are allowed to come in and pray. But Revelation 11 Verse 1 is talking about the temple of God and the altar, which do not exist today. Which means that if you go by this literally, uh, the third temple or the temple has to be rebuilt somewhere there. That's the place, the site, uh, the original place, you know, where the, the piece of land that David had bought from this man Obadidom and had and then consecrated it for the temple. So now there are some people who who interpret Revelation verse one as spiritual or figurative. They don't believe in a literal temple. So I'm just giving it giving you a different point of view. Uh, so there will be some people who whom you may hear who say, no, 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 this is not a physical temple, it's a spiritual temple kind of thing. But when we understand Revelation 11.1 1, with what we have read in Daniel 7, uh, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, in the book of Daniel, you know, when, we, when we read that, Daniel's visions, it talks about a literal temple. It's talking about this this. We call we calling him Antichrist. Daniel doesn't call him the Antichrist, but this man of sin, this son of perdition that we call as the Antichrist, who goes into that literal temple. He sets himself up as God. And Daniel 12 again talks about a lit literal physical temple that is cleansed. Cleansed. So same thing. Uh, when Jesus refers in Daniel 20, in Matthew 24, when Jesus refers to the son of perdition sitting in the temple, this abomination of desolation, he is speaking of it as a literal temple. Same thing when Paul writes in Second Thessalonians chapter two uh, about this man of sin, he's talking about him. Uh, the abomination of desolation in a literal sense, not a spiritual sense. So what I want to, I would, I, my personal understanding and belief is that this is a literal temple, right? He's talking about the temple of God. He's saying, go and measure it. It's not just a spiritual temple. No, there's a literal temple. And also when you look at the next verse, it's talking about, he says, you know, the outer court is going to be trampled or the court outside the temple is going to be trampled by the Gentiles. So this is, you know, this is literal. That means the non-Jewish, the Gentiles are going to come in and they're going to be desecrating this place. Right? So obviously it has to be a literal temple. Right? So, uh, so Revelation 11 is talking about this temple. It's talking about this place that is being desecrated. <laughs> And verse 2 says, the Gentiles will trample the holy city. Holy city always refers to Jerusalem for 42 months. So here the time is given correctly. 42 months is three and a half years. That's why we are saying Revelation 11, 1 begins from the middle of the tribulation. That means everything that has been spoken to us so far is the first half of the tribulation. Revelation 11, 1 is talking about 42 months, which means it goes from the middle of the tribulation till the end. So that's how we break it up, right? So what's going to happen from the middle of the tribulation till the end? The temple is going to be desecrated by the Gentiles. And we know additional details from other scriptures that uh, this man of sin, the Antichrist, is going to set himself up as God. He is going to demand to be worshipped. We will see this in chapter 13. Um, 
and he is going to speak blasphemies against the Most High God. So all this is happening there in the middle, starting at the middle of the tribulation. And Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, Daniel said very correct, Daniel said that uh, he will uh, he will establish a covenant for one week, that is seven years. But in the middle of the week, that is three and a half years, he will break the covenant. Right. So it all bears, you know, it's all going aligned with what Daniel has spoken, right? Then verse 3, we we see the two witnesses that are introduced, right? And they, once again, it says, they will prophesy 1,260 days. That is approximately same, three and a half years or 42 months. So once again, there's a, uh, you know, a repeat of the time period. So these Two witnesses will be prophesying. They will do, you know, they will do wonderful things. And verse four, uh, Revelation eleven, verse four, uh, it's using figurative language. Two olive trees, two lampstands. So this is borrowing language from Zechariah. So if you look at Zechariah chapter four, verses eleven to fourteen, there. Uh, the priests, the, the the priests of God, are referred to as uh, olive trees, lampstands. Right. So it's using figurative language. So these two people are like that: two olive trees and two lampstands. That means they are people of God, men of God, or priests of God, or prophets of God. Right. So they that's what it's using figurative language to represent prophets of God, or priests of God, or men of God. So two olive trees, two, they are like that. And what will they do? They will do powerful signs and wonders, you know, and their power to shut up the heaven and they can, during the times they prophesy. And, uh, uh, you know, so, so th if anybody tries to harm them during that three and a half year period, they will strike them down, right? So now this, this the, the kinds of signs and wonders that they're doing looks very much like Elijah, uh, the prophet, right? And sure enough, uh, we know from uh, Malachi, so if you turn with me to Malachi chapter 4, and uh, the exact verse is Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5, uh, Malachi chapter 4 verse 5, um, the prophet Malachi spoke about uh, Elijah. He said, Malachi chapter 4 verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Verse 6. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Malachi 4, 5 and 6. So we see very clearly here that Malachi had prophesied that God would send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great day of the Lord. Now, there are, of course, lots of questions and lots of discussions around this. Uh, I'll just quickly mention, you know, the kinds of discussions you might encounter when you when you read uh, about uh, the understanding of Revelation 11. So first, obviously, is the question, who are these two witnesses? Uh, so the general, you know, you will read many people who say that, well, that's one is Elijah, because... Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5 clearly says, God will send Elijah the prophet. Um, and then there is the whole question of who is the second one? Some may say it could be Enoch, and some may say it's Moses. And the reasoning behind it, Enoch is was the one who, like Elijah, was taken up into heaven without dying. So the rationale is, these two men never died physically, so God will send them back so that they die physically. Um, some say it's Moses because on the Mount of Transfiguration, it, um, Mo, uh, Elijah and Moses appeared uh, in the, on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. So some say, well, that the second prophet whom God sends would be Moses. Um, so there are these different, uh, you know, ideas or propositions on who these two uh, prophets would be. Personal opinion, 
my personal thought is it's most likely uh, Elijah and Enoch, uh, simply because both these men uh, were, didn't die physically, but were taken up into heaven. So God would send them back um, you know, to die physically on the, on the earth. My, 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 that's my thought. Uh, but you know, if it's Moses and Elijah, perfectly fine. It's not uh, something to worry about. Now, a couple of questions that arise upon this in connection with the two prophets is, how would these two prophets show up on the earth? So if it is going to be Moses and Enoch, they are right now in heaven. Elijah was taken to heaven in a chariot of fire. Enoch was caught up to heaven. How are they going to show up on the earth? You know, so that's a point of discussion. And my thought is, well, if God caught them up physically into heaven, it's no big thing for God to drop them back on the earth physically in Jerusalem at that point in time. That is in the middle of the tribulation. No big deal. I know it's quite a strange that two men who lived thousands of years ago are dropped back onto the planet in the middle of the tribulation, how would they, you know, we talk about culture shock. <laughs> what kind of a shock would they have, or, you know, and all these questions. But I just feel that if God wants to drop Elijah and Enoch back on the earth, literally, why not? He can prepare them and put them back on the earth. So that's my thought. Then there is this other idea that maybe it's two people who are born, you know, somewhere around the time of the, the these things happening. They're born physically and they come in the same anointing as Elijah and Enoch or Elijah and Moses. So that's another thinking or a thought. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. That's possible. Uh, of course, one reference point is that people say, you know, John the Baptist, he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And Jesus referred to him saying, Elijah is here. This is in Matthew 17. Uh, I'll give you the exact verse, uh, Matthew 17 and uh, verse 11 and 12. Matthew 17, 11 and 12. So uh, Matthew 17, 11 and 12, Jesus said about John the Baptist, Elijah is here. But he also said, Elijah is coming, right? So he was referring to John the Baptist who came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And he said, Elijah is here. So John the Baptist was a different human being, but he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And Jesus said, Elijah is here. So some people, you know, use that as a reference to say that maybe these two witnesses that are being spoken of in Revelation 11 could be Elijah and Enoch or Elijah and Moses, maybe two people who, are, who were born during the, that time uh, and who are, you know, maybe in the 20s or 30s or 40s, whatever, uh, but who come in the anointing of Elijah and Moses or Elijah and Enoch. Uh, is that a possibility? And I say, yeah, maybe it's possible, right? So he, whichever way this, this prophecy is going to be fulfilled, it's fine. You know, God is going to do it the way he sees best. Uh, what would be my inclination? Uh, my inclination would be leaning towards uh, God dropping Enoch and Elijah physically on the earth. I know it sounds crazy, but I don't find it that big of a difficulty for God 
if he took them up into heaven, he can drop them back on the earth and get them ready for the assignment on the earth for three and a half years. Right. So it's okay. But with me, I'm, I'm, and I, I believe God could do that. So either way, so you will find different um, parts and positions on this and it's fine. It's not something to argue about. It's just us exploring uh, in what ways could this prophecy about these two witnesses be fulfilled. Okay. Uh, any thoughts, any questions on that before we go for a break? I'm just giving you different ideas. I'm not trying to confuse you. I'm just giving you different ideas of how people understand how these two witnesses will come on the earth. Um, all right. Any questions? Everyone's okay so far? All right. So, um, what we'll do now is we'll just we'll go for our break, and we will come back and we'll continue with chapter eleven, just talking about what else happens with these two witnesses. Okay. So let's go for a quick break, and we will come back. Thank you. <laughs> 